Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me to present today. Uh, a couple of things before I start. Uh, Pathology Queensland, we're the public pathology provider for the state of Queensland. Um, and the ACU, or the Analytical Chemistry Unit, has a number of roles within uh, Pathology Queensland. One of them is therapeutic drug monitoring, so we do all the immunosuppressant drugs. We also do a lot of the um, newborn screening as well. And I'll talk a little bit about newborn screening because that's really the domain of DBS and we'll expand from that. As Jason said this morning about the, the hurricanes, well, I'm a Queensland Red supporter and we haven't been happy since 2011. So <laughs> the other thing too is my slide is not as pretty and as colourful as Rhonda's. So I'm a male, as Rhonda told me this morning, so that's the reason why hers is colourful. She's a female, I'm male. So there we go. So let's have a quick look, a bit of an outline of what we can talk about. We'll talk about dry blood spots. And this is going to be very much a perspective from the lab. So we've talked about developing these assays and validating the assays, but it's a lot harder and a lot of more things you consider when you develop an assay. You've got to have an assay that's robust, and that's the big thing. You've got to be able to run it from day to day consistency. So we're going to talk about analytical issues faced by the lab, how we overcome these issues, or hopefully overcome the issues, talk a bit about dry blood spot quality and hematocrit, and I think Rhonda touched on that, but I'll just show you a couple of other examples as well. So let's talk about dry blood spot first. The thing to remember from a, from a lab perspective is that we're looking at small sample volume, but normal analyte concentration within that sample. So if we compare it, say, something like saliva, oh, hold on. Oh, I had saliva then, I've that one. So we have saliva for an example. The sample volume is higher, but usually the, the concentration is lower because we're looking at, if your drugs are highly protein bound, you're really looking at a filtrate in saliva, so levels are low. So you, it's, it's horses for courses, you've got to target what you're looking at in the matrix. So we talk about dry blood spot up front, most people think about straight away as newborn screening and, and typically in, in Queensland alone, the newborn screening service does about 70,000 dry blood spots per year, that's just Queensland alone. And um, the reason for this is that uh, we, back with Chase, he came through and looked at PKU analysis and screening for PKU and dried blood spots was the ideal matrix for people to use and people then started using mass spec for it. We also then had the development of stable isotope internal standards and from a newborn screening perspective they found that to a degree they didn't really have to have too much chromatographic separation because you remember from newborn screening we are screening so our precision won't be quite as we're not looking at five percent we may be 15 or 20 percent but we look at very high or very low or normal. So to a degree, we did need as much. The other thing too is if we want to push through five or 600 samples per night to get results out next morning for the doctors to act, every minute helps, and every minute we can save helps us long term. So we could have rapid analysis times, we could do large numbers. Uh, we've extended it out to um, MSUD, looking at the branch chain amino acids, have also expanded out even further, looking at the uh, acyl carnitines, looking for some of these disorders as well. So, how do we go about collecting a blood spot? And I've quickly gone through a procedure here. The patient, we disinfect the area, we prick it with a lancet, we put it on the card, we dry it, and it's essential that it's dry. That's the most important thing. Transport, transport mailing, punching it, extraction, analysis. It all sounds nice and easy, blah, 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 blah. But it's a little bit harder than all that. So let's talk about workflow. So the sample comes in to the area and we'll have a manual extraction or maybe automated, and I'll quickly show you some examples. We'll punch out that card and we'll extract and we'll shake and then we'll transfer the supernatant and we may then run it by LC mass spec or there are other platforms to use as well, depending on the analyte you're looking at. So let's talk about blood spotting. Again, we put the spot onto the card. I've just got an example here. Um, you don't let it touch, you're going to use pipette, dry, as I said, that's crucial. You need to store it in sealable bags with a desiccant. That's crucial for long term. Now again, we provide the service for all of Queensland, but also Northern Territory as well. And so what happens is you can get a sample that may be collected in Thursday Island, and it makes, takes four or five days to come and get through to us, through the postal service, the way Australia Post is uh, delivering these days. Sample prep. Now, we can punch out the card. Now, we can punch out either using a manual punch, 
which I don't know how many people like to punch out 500 spots per night, or you can have an automated system. And what you can do with the automated system, you can put it in, puts it in, punches it for you, drops it into your 96 well plate, nice and easy, very much to do. And then you extract it with your organic solvent, typically maybe methanol, but that depends on what you're trying to extract from your, cell, from your, your dried blood spot, containing your labelled internal standard. Now, once we've done all that, we've put it all on. I've just put a chromatogram here. This is a, a drug and it's metabolite and the middle... And then the labelled internal standard. Uh, and we've moved to UPLC front ends because of the, the we get a much increase in sensitivity, we can get resolving power, but also we increase the speed of our analysis. And as I said, if you're doing several hundred samples a night, uh, every minute you can save per sample has a significant knock-on effect for you. So disease that we screen, and I know I've touched a little bit on, on newborn screening, but I think it's very important because the things that we've identified in newborn screening, particularly with dry blood spots, are amenable to lots of other things. The processes are the same. So in a typical run, we'll have PKU, hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, galactosemia, a lot of the amino acidopathies, urea cycle defects, organic acidemias, fatty acid oxidation disorders. Now, I think one of the big advantages of dry blood spots is in each sample that we get, we punch out four spots. And they'll go different ways. One will go for hypothyroidism, one will go for cystic fibrosis, one will go to galactosemia, and one will go there. So from the one spot, we can do a lot of different things. Now, not all of these are done on mass spec. The hypothyroidism is still done, the TSH is still done by immunoassay and the, the cystic fibrosis and enzymatic assay. But that's one of the nice things. From one spot, as long as it's a good quality spot, we can do a number of different things. And that's a, that's, I think that's a, for a lab that wants to do a variety of things, it's important to be able to have that uh, facility. So I just want to quickly touch on a PKU, just to show you the advantages. And this, and this is a brand new, this is a paper, baby that was born to Logan Hospital. For people who don't know, Logan's Hospital, that's about uh, 15, 20 kilometres south of uh, Brisbane. Born in the uh, middle of September this year. Had a newborn screening card at uh, three, roughly three days old. The sample sent through to us. We looked at it. The phenylalanine was 570, tyrosine was 39. The feed tyrosine ratio was 15, indicating the patient may be screened, may have phenylketonuria. Contact the, the physician. We wanted an urgent sample, wanted to repeat it. Got the same result. Contacted the metabolic physician. Another sample was collected a day or two later, and as you can see, the phenylalanine's got higher, the tyrosine the ratio has got higher still. So the results confirm that the patient actually had PKU. Uh, uh, repeat samples done five days after treatment. So a special diet where they actually go on low protein, uh, a low phenylalanine diet. But again, it gives you, shows you the, the advantages of, the, of, of a, a dry blood spot that we can do these things very quickly, give a result back very quickly. The clinician can intervene and essentially prevent child having significant issues by intervention early. And that's the advantage of some of these things where you can move samples through very quickly with dry blood spots. So some of the advantages, particularly in clinical trials, well, like I said, it's less invasive. It's much easier to post-collection handling. You can store it at room temperature. Most of these things can, and you don't have to ship with dry ice. So for large studies that are at the outside, one of the big costs is, is shipping things on dry ice. It's a fortune. Um, we get samples from New Zealand. Um, and a ship an esky across from Waikato is about $1,500. That's an es a small esky. I mean, you could fly from back and forth about four times for the same thing, but it's a significant cost. Um, as I said, it's much easier. Storage is simpler to do and reduced cost. The other thing, too, with dry blood spots is you don't really need an accurate measure of the sample that's volume that you've sampled. You minimise your volume that you're using. And it's a nice way to store long term. And, and for newborn screening, and I'm assuming for a lot of these other drug trials, we've got to store samples for 28 years post collection. So, as you can imagine, if you're generating 60 or 70,000 samples per year and you've got to store these things for 28 years, that's a lot of samples to be stored and you want to have it in a matrix where it's reasonably stable. So, the other thing, too, is if you're doing some drug trial things as well the patient can take it at home, and if you're doing, say, an area under the curve or time collection, it allows you to collect it at certain things. And you see that quite often with children who have been diagnosed with CAH, and they're on CAH monitoring. So they're doing supplements, and they want to make sure the child is getting adequately uh, supplemented with uh, hydrocortisone. 
The other thing too is that many of these compounds are reasonably stable. Once you put them in the form and they're dried, and also they're a bit of a reduced biohazard. But again, with you get on one hand, you lose on the other hand. So some of the disadvantages. Well, you need highly sensitive methods because you're looking at low volumes. And so you've got to be aware of that as well. So as Rhonda said, that's part of the domain where LCM mass spec has come in and has enabled us to push down further and further in lower levels. The other thing too is, however, from a lab perspective, is if I get a sample which have a high result, a very high result, what do I do? It's not very easy to, to, to do a dilution because it's in a solid for sample format. What do I do with this? How do I, do I punch a smaller hole? It's a lot of extra work downstream. I said mass spec gives you the sensitivity, it gives you a wide range, and it's typically the, the process that most people are going for at the moment for a dry blood spot, but also other micro sampling techniques as well. For people doing drug levels too, total levels are measured, not free. And there's been a quick push lately over the last few years to look at free drug levels. So if you want to look at free drug levels, blood spots aren't really the way to go. So you've got to consider that. You're going to get a total result. Contamination risk, and again, people put, uh, plate, put them in together. They don't separate them. They can go against each other. You can get cross-contamination occurring. You need much more extensive validation because you've introduced another significant variable in your whole process, the card. And I'll talk a little bit about that for you. Again, where do I punch? The side of punching. There are machines now which hopefully will scan the plate for you and idea where the best part to punch. Again, that's nice, but it's significant cost and I don't know how reliable they really are. So also the blood volume is spotted. And people have touched on this thing called the hematocrit effect and I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples of what we're talking about. So um, it's really depending on how much the sample will spread across the, sa across the actual plate. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples of what they're talking about. So the analytical issues, what have we ever got to overcome? Well, from a clinical laboratory, this is a non-liquid format. And we're used to having plasma, urine, whole blood, whatever else. Now you give me a piece of paper, it's a card, what do I do? I mean, a lot of our processes are not designed for uh, a solid format. They're, they're very much liquid. So it's a bit of a change of mindset. Again, when we extract it out, we're going to get the blood components. We're going to extract everything out, hopefully salts, endogenous, analytes, everything. And so we're going to get suppression issues, so we've got to address those issues as part of our method development and validation. As I said, most clinical laboratories, and I'm talking from a clinical perspective here, are highly automated, great, but they're not really used to using this format. And so it really requires a different way of doing things, but also quite often large reference laboratories to do the work. Do we approach, do we either manual or automated, depending on numbers. So again, if you're going to go to automated, great, but there is a certain cost involved with that as well, which you've got to look and address. The other thing to note too is that perhaps 10 to 15% of the compounds you're looking for, you may not be able to detect, even on the latest mass specs. If the levels are really low, you may be pushing so far down into the dirt, into the grass, you're not going to see them. It also depends on the analyte you're looking for. It may not fly in the mass spec. So it may have very poor sensitivity. So again, if, if that's the issue, well then you can't, you can't really use dry blood spots. Card background may cause issues. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. The actual cards themselves, there are a number of different cards available. And I'll show you a, a, a real example of why um, you've got to investigate that. And again, hematocrit being an issue that we've got to address and how do we overcome that issue. Now, the other thing too is we've got our sample is now on that dry blood spot card. We've got to get it off that sample card into solution. Now, a good example here was Everolimus. It's a very lipophilic compound. When they put it into the dry blood spot, put it into the card, dries, it sticks to that card very, very strongly. So you've got to somehow have methanol to a degree, may not get it off. You've got to look at those things. So depending on your, your analog you're looking at, this is an issue you've got to get. How do I get it on the card? On the card's okay. How do I get it off the card? And that's the thing you've really got to look at and address. The other thing too is if I punch and get a, a, on, a pray, on a finger, I get local trauma. People get in, they squeeze it to me. I get interstitial fluid. I get dilutional effects. I have all these issues to overcome. So they're the things you've got to consider. And, and that's part of the reason why we've tried blood spots to a degree and other things. You're going to get larger CVs. 
And this is a big one for me too, is the incorporation of the internal standard into the process. Now, as everyone knows, the internal standard is crucial, but how do you get it in? It's in solution already. My analyte of interest is stuck to the card. How do I get reproducible extraction from the card to solution? Now, people have used before proposing getting the collection cards and actually putting the internal standard onto the card prior to spotting. Or you can have it where you put it into the solution you extract across. And some people are also looking where they drive blood spot technology where they actually put it onto the card and they can elute straight from the card into the mass spec. There's all different ways with these things to consider. And again, it's very much analyte specific. So you've got to investigate things, these things. So that's why I'm talking, saying the validation is extensive because you've introduced a new variable which you've got to look at. And the other thing too, is a big one, is carryover. So what I'm talking about carryover is we're punching a card. So you get card to card interaction. You've also got the punch. When it punches it from one card, then it moves on to another card, carry over from card to card. And if you've got a sample, you've got a trough sample following after a peak, you make a contamination or carry over. So you've got to investigate those things. So it's not a straightforward process to follow. and You've really got to um, uh, address them. So how do we overcome these uh, techniques? Well, what we hopefully do is can we direct sampling the dry blood spot? So there's no need to actually do an elution. We can actually, can we elute straight from the dry blood spot into the mass spec? That's that one way of doing it. 2D chromatography or online SPE will hopefully enable us to clean up the sample and to remove a lot of these interfering compounds. So when we inject in, we cut in exactly what we want to into the mass spec and we cut away a lot of the rubbish and a lot of the, we remove a lot of the suppression issues. So quickly just talk about this, what I said before about the cards can have an effect. I've just got some cards here. These are WAP and ones. Some are treated, some are untreated. And some of these things are treated with chemicals that lyse the cell or they inactivate pathogens or degradate uh, enzymes. And so, well, that sounds good. That does a job. But what we've got here is those, four, those three cards and we've done a full scan background of the signal. And there's an enormous amount of extra things coming off these cards. These are cards with no samples. It's just all the proprietary things are on the card. So we've got to look at that. Has that have an impact on what our chromatography, our results? So there's another variable to consider. Finally, dried blood spot quality. And there's a great card. That's, a, that's one coming through. Uh, nice, the whole lot. If we want to, we can easily punch out four, three mil uh, spots. No problems at all. And we've got two extra spots there in case we need to do a repeat. All good. Um, I'll have to say that Papua New Guinea is not the only place that has poor quality. That's the other dried spot quality we've had before. And occasionally we get one coming through with no blood at all. So someone is very anemic. Um, and this is what we're going to deal with. So what happens in this situation here, this is an unsaturated. So what do we do? So from a, a PK drug, you mostly would say, look, we can't really do, use this one. From a newborn screening, we mostly would still punch that. Because if we've got the, one on the, the first one here and we've got a very high result, well, therefore we know that it's still very high. We'd still get a recollection. But we need to act early if we can to try to intervene if the case is an issue. So I'll quickly finish up here a little bit about hematocrit effect. And as we said here, it's the, it's the influence of the spread of blood on the card. It varies from patient to patient. But why is it important or what is the impact? And it can be divided, divided into two aspects. So the analytical impact, viscosity of the blood, you get differential spreading. The extraction of the compounds. Perhaps if it's a higher protein, the extraction of that compound will be, be less, unless you've got a sample that's got a low hematocrit. You also get matrix effects. So therefore, if I've got a sample that's got a very low hematocrit, and it spreads out and I punch it, I'm putting on less rubbish as well. So there are things to consider. And as Rhonda touched on, this is blood to a plasma ratio of the compounds. How does it vary and how does it impact on what we want to do? Um, just practical examples, I've got a couple of examples here for you as well, just, and I think Ron has touched on this, but I'll just go again. So what we've got here is, is six blood spots from A through to F. Uh, A is 25%, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75 being F. And as you can see, we've put on the, they've put on the same volume of blood. And as you go from, from left to right and then down, you can see there's a concentration. So therefore, if I punch in this one here, relative to that one there, I'm going to get a more concentrated sample than the other one. So there are things to, to consider when you are doing some of the work. So a bit of a conclusion about dry blood spots. 
as I said, it was initially used in, in newborn screening, but it's still spreading out into a number of different areas as well. Um, mass spec has enabled it to, to be used in, in, in to increase its, its uh, range of, of applications. It's now going to therapeutic drug monitoring, some toxicology work and, and kinetic work. However, you do need extra work uh, as part of your validation. But a thing to note is a number of matrix-specific issues must be considered, overcome, or minimised. Because with some of these issues you may not get rid of completely, so what you've got to do is reduce the impact on your final results. But however, and I'm not talking just about blood spots here, micro-sampling techniques will certainly play a significant role in the analysis of number of biomarkers as we move forward. Uh, and again, if we can reduce the amount of sample that we take, it makes things significantly easier and more conducive for the patient. Finally, I just put my contact details. If people are interested in, in, in um, work with Pathology Queensland, this is my email address, uh, my phone number, and that's our address. So I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>